So with this session, I want to start with the um, elephant in the room, plastics. Plastics are everywhere today. You know, they are part of our systems. Around 300 million ton is produced annually, and a lot of them end up in uh, oceans where they are uh, constitute to 80% of marine debris. Plastic, of course, isn't an ocean issue. It's a land issue that uh, basically materializes itself uh, in the oceans. Um, it's also not a consumer's issue. It's, it's a classic tragedy of the commons issue where everybody is responsible, yet nobody is taking action uh, to solve it. And uh, many countries, especially emerging market economies, lack the infrastructure to prevent um, that uh, waste. So the blue economy is the equivalent of the seventh economy, and it provides the livelihood to three billion people. Um, it's under threat due to climate change, biodiversity loss, and also pollution. Um, so it's really where all the components of the triple planetary crisis, as we speak about, uh, as within UNEP, uh, come together. Um, WWF has calculated that over 8 trillion US dollars worth of ocean related assets and revenues face physical and transition risks in the next 15 years. Um, UNEP FI has been working on um, the blue economy since the last few years, most in particular through our Sustainable Blue uh, Finance Initiative, which has over uh, 80 members. Some of them are also members of other UNEPFI initiatives, but it also includes many um, development banks. And through the network and the principles, we develop industry-wide guidance on how to adapt financial activities uh, towards ocean uh, positive uh, solutions. If you go to our website, we have developed um, many guidances, among others are diving uh, deep um, on waste. Um, so again, uh, last year, UNEA, so the UN Environment Assembly, uh, came together and they made uh, the landmark decision to develop a legally binding treatment to end plastic pollution. So that's an action taken by our member states to develop um, that treaty in the next two years. So I think it's important to see that we see um, at COP15, we had the agreement of the um, uh, Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Earlier this year, the UN concluded its uh, high seas treaty. And I think with this plastic treaty, we really have the last uh, framework needed um, to support um, our oceans. So I think the role of finance really is to move capital from um, business as usual, because most investments in oceans are now from uh, philanthropic or pr uh, public sources. So we need investments from uh, the financial sector. We're very happy to have Wuri here on the stage because um, they sit in the financial leadership group on plastic. Um, so we'll speak about that later. So I think here on stage we have Hejun from, from Wuri, um, who you already know, so I won't ask him to um, introduce himself uh, again, we have Regula Slack, who is the uh, managing director of Circular Capital, and John G, who is the COO of Marina Chain. So, um, as in our previous session, as a warm up, I would like you to uh, introduce yourself uh, to our audience, uh, and maybe you can start, uh, Regula. You need to no. turn it on. Yes, now wonderful. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Romy and UNEP FI. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Regula Shek. I, I am working for an investment firm based out of Singapore. We started in 2019, and what we really wanted to 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 be a catalytic, uh, being catalytic in attracting capital, investing into a systemic supply chain of plastic recycling in South and Southeast Asia. Um, why am I personally very interested in that topic? Uh, prior to my engagement with Circular Capital, I have been living and working in the Philippines with informal communities, 
um, and I saw firsthand what it does and what it means to people who are threatened daily by the amount of waste in their waterways, but also seeing how they um, made a livelihood out of collecting the material for recycling um, purposes. And seeing that firsthand really made me understand that we need very systemic solution to a global systemic problem at hand. Thank you. Thank you, Regula. And I'm moving to you, John, uh, with a quick intro. Hi, yes. I'm. Uh, so, so I actually work at the company Marina Chain. We are a maritime startup based in Singapore, um, co founded by both Singaporeans and Koreans. So we work extensively with ship owners and ship builders with respect to, in particular, their ESG performance in terms of emissions, in terms of other forms of environmental impacts. So, I mean, right now, the pressing thing for, you know, uh, in, the, in my time industry, shipping, there has been a very big push towards environmental friendliness because of, uh, from the UN and also from financiers like banks, and this is, yeah, I think we, we're seeing that this is a step in the right direction. It's something that, you know, these companies are for profits. So as things are, as they are more financially incentivized to go green, it's, uh, yeah, I think th this is why we, this is, this is why we joined the space because um, I would say the industry is something that's very ripe for, you know, um, for env environmental change. Thank you. Thank you so much. As with the earlier session, we really welcome your active participation. So although I'm asking questions now, if you if you feel that you're you know wanting to ask a question, uh, please do. Um, I want to start with the first question to you, Regula. Um, so uh, together with the World Economic Forum, you released the report Unlocking the Plastic Circular Economy, Case Studies on Investment. And I think my very obvious question to you is, you know, what are inspiring examples of investment solutions in circular plastic economy here in the APAC uh, region? And I think whenever we speak about investment, there's always the discussion about, you know, how do we really scale up these investments and make them uh, mainstream? So maybe you can briefly speak about the report first and then uh, about the questions that I posed. Um, thank you very much. So you actually mentioned that a lot of the capital invested today is of philanthropic nature and from governments. Um, when we look at the overall global um, plastic supply chain, and if we want to bring it to towards a s from a linear towards a circular supply chain, there is estimate about $1.2 trillion needed. And so it is very clear that that capital is not coming from the philanthropic uh, you know, industry or, or from governments, but it is very clear that it has to come from the financial industry, from, from, from institutional investors. The report you mentioned um, has, has showcases examples of how capital can really change the paradigm um, and, and bring solutions to, to, to the world, to the countries, in, in, in tackling the waste or the, the plastics in itself. Let me give you two examples um, which come from our own portfolio, um, which one is in Indonesia. It's called Treaty Oasis. Um, Circular Capital has made an investment in Treaty Oasis in 2020. It's a small, a small mid-sized enterprise, I would say. It's female-led. Um, they've started with recycling PET bottles, so basically what we have here, into flakes, so that it can go into fiber applications. We invested through a loan, which was uh, partially guaranteed by uh, the US DF, uh, DFI, uh, or DFC, um, as, as a blended finance mechanism. And that capital enabled the company to upscale to the next level and increase their capacity of uh, pet recycling. That also included, obviously, upscaling or uh, improving their, their wastewater treatment, their entire operations, the way they actually uh, operate their facilities. 
Um, we also provided technical assistance or capacity building to really help them to the next level so that they can engage with multinational corporation as, as off-takers, um, as, uh, as clients or, 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 or um, customers. Because of that investment, we could say that they started attracting a large multinational waste manager. And in 2022, in August, they actually started or ventured into a joint venture with that multinational waste manager to go one step further to food grade application obviously using a PT bottle, not into fiber, but into food grade application, closing the loop. That is one example which I think is very interesting from a perspective how essential blended finance mechanisms work and how they can actually help small and mid-sized enterprises growing to the next level, um, basically leapfrogging frogging to the next level. A second example uh, from our portfolio, which was mentioned in that study, is a company in India. You may be aware that the Swaj Parao, the, the, the Clean India Mission, um, has really bolstered the industry in India uh, in focusing on investing in recycling. Um, Recycle is the first or India's first waste commerce platform, which connects all the players, the, the recyclers, the collectors, the off-takers, uh, the corporations to, to trade. It also provides transparency and traceability within the system, which is really critical in, in how we need to build sustainable supply chains in plastic recycle. It is also a platform which enables or allows corporations to use for extended producer responsibility. So it's really a great way to provide transparency and traceability, as I mentioned. And it's also a great way and, and, and to showcase how supportive frameworks like the Extended Producer Responsibility Act of India uh, in, in um, brings the attention to this kind of investment opportunities. Now these are two investments I mentioned which are more targeted towards SMEs. But there are also obviously uh, opportunities mentioned in this, in this uh, publication which focus more on larger scale uh, investment opportunities where we talk about green bonds or where we talk about blue bonds. And one example is, for example, is uh, the, uh, a blue bond uh, which was uh, uh, issued by Indorama uh, Ventures, which is the world's largest uh, RPET bottlers or, or producer. Um, and they were able to uh, get a, a, a bond um, by three development finance corporations, which ena enables them to double their uh, recycling capacity, um, which is another example. I think what is most important is that we don't just focus on, on one spectrum, um, let's say, you know, large corporations to get access to finance through uh, sustain sustainability linked bonds or blue bonds or green bonds, but also focus on SMEs. And as we heard yesterday, because ultimately in most of the emerging markets, the small and mid-sized enterprises are the ones who are uh, often are, are, are prevented from accessing capital. And there it is very important that exactly those examples are showcased, that the institutional investors start to understand that it is an investable industry. There is money to be made beyond the very important environmental and social impact. And our role is really to showcase and be catalytic in attracting that capital. So we need to focus on both, and I think that's important. Um, so what is needed, it is transparency around deal flow, what investment opportunities are out there for investors to invest. What is needed is also access to different kind of investment opportunities for institutional investors to come in. And what is also needed is additional data gathering so we have a baseline to attract more capital to understand what is the impact when we put our money down into these investment opportunities. And I can elaborate more later, um, but that just in a nutshell. Mainly to mention, by the way, the report um, has not been published by us. It has been published together with the World Economic Forum by our sister entity, uh, which is a mission aligned uh, partner of ours. Thank you so much, Regula. And I think just to uh, remind ourselves that, you know, circular is nothing new. Um, there is no waste in nature. We're the only animal that produces 
uh, waste, and it's very important if you look at circularity that it's not about downcycling, but really upcycling of raw materials. So I want to turn to you, Hejun, um, and uh, great that you're joining us for both these uh, panels. So I want to ask you if you can give an example of how Worry Financial Group is taking action to both reduce and prevent plastic uh, waste, and uh, what challenges you as a financial uh, institution uh, face uh, in interacting with your clients uh, around tackling uh, plastic uh, pollution. Yes. 먼저 노력에 대해 말씀드리겠습니다. 어, 그 저희 같은 경우에는 다음 세대에 자연 회복 및 그리고 수단 경제의 중요성을 알리고 나아가 국민 공감대 형성과 국제 사회 협력을 통해서 플라스틱 오염이 증가하지 않고 수단 경제 사회가 구축될 수 있는 여건을 좀 형성하려고 많이 노력하고 있습니다. 그래서 예를 들어 우리 금융 그룹은 작년에 전국 35개 초등학교 학생들과 함께 생활 속폐 플라스틱을 6개월 동안 수거하였고 어, 수거한 플라스틱으로 업사이클링한 화분을 제작하였습니다. 그리고 제작한 1천여 개 화분을 학교 교실 숲 조성을 위해서 어, 초등학교에 기부를 하였습니다. 어, 또한 그, 국내 금융사 최초로 순환경제 컨퍼런스를 개최하여 플라스틱 오염 및 순환경제 사회 전환에 대한 이해관계자 인식 제고와 공감대를 형성하였습니다. 어, 사실 잘 아시다시피 환경 문제는 결코 혼자서는 해결할 수 없습니다. 고객, 기업, 시민, 국가 모두 협력해야 합니다. 그래서 저희는 유네베 파이와 함께 금융 전환을 통해 순환 경제 생태계 조성 및 관련 기업 성장을 촉진하고자 순환 경제 목표 수립을 지원하는 가이던스를 개발 공개하였습니다. 요대 FI 홈페이지에 들어가면 참조하실 수 있습니다. 또 내부적으로는 Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Principle처럼 순환 경제에 대한 대원칙과 정책 목표 수립을 검토하고 있고 이를 바탕으로 지속 가능한 비즈니스 기업들과 협업 기회를 지금 모색 중입니다. 어, 예를 들어서 최근 폐 플라스틱이 사회 문제가 되고 있는 가운데 바이오 플라스틱 시장 성장을 지원하여 폐기물 순환 경제 생태계를 구축하고 바이오 소재 사업 확대와 탄소 중립 달성을 추진하고자 합니다. 특히 화이트 바이오 플라스틱은 생산 과정에서 탄소 배출량도 상대적으로 적기 때문에 탄소 중립 시대에 아주 적합한 기술인 측면이 있습니다. 우리 금융그룹은 지속 가능한 플라스틱 생태계를 구축하기 위해 국내외 기업들과 협력하여 그린, 화이트, 바이오 사업을 적극 발굴할 예정입니다. 어, 그리고 그리고 그 챌린지 고객과 플라스틱 오염 문제를 해결할 때 직면하는 챌린지에 대해서 말씀을 좀 드리면 플라스틱 선형 경제에서 순환 경제로 전환하기 위해서는 고객 참여가 필수적입니다. 어, 자산 포트폴리오 전환은 고객이 순환 경제 활동을 할수 있도록 지원하고 인센티브를 제공할 때 달성이 됩니다. 하지만 단순한 인센티브 제공은 재무 흐름에 단기적으로 부정적인 영향을 줄수 있습니다. 어, 우리는 이 갭에 대한 해결이 좀 필요합니다. 따라서 그 인센티브를 넘어서 고객 참여를 적극적으로 이끌어내려면 명확한 비전과 목표 제시, 역량 분석, 기회 요인이 고객에게 필요합니다. 어, 따라서 금융기관은 고객에게 아주 강력한 긍정적인 시그널을 줘야 하고 그들과 함께 협력을 해야 합니다. 그러려면 금융기관은 고객의 니즈 파악 등 이해가 선행되어야 하고 고객이 순환 경제 활동으로 잘 참여할 수 있게 이해도도 높여야 합니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 SME는 당장의 재무 흐름을 무시할 수 없기 때문에 대기업에 비해 소극적인 것은 사실입니다. 어, 그리고 자원 순환 및 목표 수립 시 기준선이 국가마다, 기업마다 그리고 애매모호합니다. 그 이유는 기준선 설정을 위한 역량 분석, 현 수준 분석이 매우 어렵기 때문입니다. 영양 분석에는 모니터링 체계 구축, 뭐 지표 및 기준, 측정 방법 개발과 그리고 
자산을 구성하고 있는 고객 제품 비중 파악도 필요합니다. 또한 영양 분석 시 디자인, 생산, 사용, 재활용 등 순환 측면의 영양과 온실가스, 폐기물, 용수 등의 환경 측면의 영양 그리고 일자리 창출, 다양성, 인권, 보건 등 사회 측면의 영양이 같이 각 측면에서 많은 분석이 필요하기 때문에 유관 부서, 고객, 뭐 연구기관, 다양한 이해관계자가 우리는 필요합니다. 어, 뿐만 아니라 고객 데이터 수집을 위해서는 고객과 협력이 필요한데 이때 데이터 품질 격차가 발생할 수 있습니다. 어, 끝으로 마지막으로 무조, 무엇보다 중요한 것은 경영진의 참여와 관심입니다. 어떤 포트폴리오에 조금 초점을 더 맞출 것인지 의사결정이 필요한데 아직 이 단계까지는 도달하지 못한 것 같습니다. 뭐 이렇게 말씀드리고 보니 해결해야 될 과제들이 너무 많은 것 같습니다. 네, thank you so much, Hyun, and also by pointing out the different level of actions that you're taking with both students, with your leadership, looking at your portfolio. So I think that's amazing. So I'm turning to you now, John, with a question about how has marine decarbonization and health been advancing in the past five years, and how do you see financial activity supporting or delaying its progress? And uh, with that question, we're also interested to hear if you can please tell us how the maritime transporting se uh, sector is tackling uh, plastic waste. Uh, yeah, sure, thank you. So, with regards to decarbonization, it's, I mean, the maritime industry has been pretty slow going uh, in terms of its adoption because, yeah, generally there's been quite few regulatory pressures because of the nature of the industry is very um, scattered. It's international, it's very hard to enforce. So, uh, back in the early, 2010s, there was a push for desulfurization uh, of marine fuels, and that worked out pretty well. Uh, ships with scrubbers and so on. And back at, and then uh, from there, recently at, in 2021, at the COP26 summit, the CII regulations and DCS regulations came into place where shipping companies were now required to report their carbon intensity regulate, um, their carbon intensity from year to year. And if they didn't meet a certain grade by each, within each year, then you know, they would be penalized. So that's from the regulatory pressure of decarbonization. And separately, banks and financiers did come together to come up with a set of principles that we call the Poseidon principles, which would also assess the environmental friendliness of these Ship, uh, shipping companies, and if they were deemed to not be, you know, um, green enough, well, uh, they would, it would uh, they would be really hard pressed to find good investment, uh, good uh, financing opportunities. Which you know, these are for for these maritime uh, vessels, these are eight to nine figure sums of money just to really uh, finance these ships to you know get them into play and start to be, start to go into operations. So this was a very big push, actually. These two, both regulatory and commercial pressures, were, uh, have really come into play since 2021. And this has really shifted the industry more towards being very attentive and very uh, concerned about regulatory, uh, about, about green regulations. Now, with regards to, uh, yeah, so, uh, basically, the industry right now is slow in terms of digitization and being able to record exactly how they are, you know, uh, what you call the operational processes, whether it's for the whether it's for their current emissions or for their waste treatment, whether uh, waste treatment for water, waste treatment for plastics disposed out at sea, and so on. So here at Marina Chain, we've been very much focused on. Firstly, helping them digitize their processes to ensure that you know, for these ship owners back at shore, they know for each and every one of the vessels what are the activities they're doing, whether it's you know, dumping ballast water, whether it's um, you know, burning excess fuel, and so on. And this, is, this has been really our first step at helping the industry to you know, um, tackle that, you know, to, to start tackling that uh, journey to decarbonization. 
uh, specifically in the context of plastics, uh, I would say that the maritime industry isn't the biggest polluter because it's the concern is more for carbon emissions. But uh, we in the in in our whole service offering to these shipping companies with regards to uh, GRI reporting, GHG protocol, consulting, and so on. We do take a holistic approach to these companies in regards to how they are treating the environment. And uh, yeah, all these are taken into account as well. Thank you so much, John. Do you want to add to this question, Regula, or uh, shall I ask you the next question? Can I elaborate further on, uh, on the importance of how do we track capital uh, by the in institutional investors? Um, so, following on to also what we heard before, um, talking about information or data gap and, 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 and funding gap, right? I think what is really important is that, that to attract more capital to the market from the institutional investor is to showcase that A, there is a pipeline out there and there in are investment opportunities out there. And then also B, um, if I put my money down into an investment, how much impact or how much um, greenhouse gas emission reduction can I actually achieve? And I think um, as part of that, you know, our sister entity, uh, the Circular Initiative, um, launched a first in its kind um, plastic circularity investment tracker. What does that mean? They actually for the first time can provide globally within the emerging markets how much capital in through what financial instruments have been invested in the plastic circularity industry. And it tracks investment since 2018, th all the way through 2022. Obviously, it will be updated. And to date, uh, we, we, we have seen that from the estimated $1.2 trillion needed globally to transition and scale the plastic recycling industry to a circular economy, um, in the last four years, there have been about um, four billion invested. So it's not an industry anymore where it's like, you know, it's marginal, it's minor. No, there is actually capital going into, into the, a full circular plastic recycling industry. Um, we have been able to gather, uh, in that tool you see that there have been 414 deals made in the last four years since 2018 um, in 38 countries. Um, and as I mentioned, the deal value was about $4 billion. Um, that investment tracker is here to increase the investor's confidence in the market and to, to, to really enable them to see that this is, there is deal flow out there. So this, this information is publicly available uh, through the, the Circle Initiative website. So if you go and log in, you can really drill down by location, by plastic, what kind of plastic it is, uh, by what kind of financial means, um, and, and it really gives the transparency. Another key aspect I see is the data gap uh, in respect to, if I put the dollar into a company, particularly in the, in the area of, of small and mid-sized enterprises in the emerging markets, how much greenhouse gas emission reduction am I able to achieve? And there we have published a, uh, a uh, called the places. It's a, it's a greenhouse gas calculator, uh, currently only available for Indonesia and India. But you can actually look at if you invest in downstream waste recycling or waste collection, how and, and, and you can put it into the system, how much of that material, by being diverted and brought back into the circular economy, uh, is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I think um, these are two tools which have been developed in, in, in the past by our sister uh, entity, which are really critical to bring transparency to the market. They're open source, they're available, they're here to increase the investor's confidence into the market and enable the investors to access the market. I think that is really key to, to how we actually go further uh, beyond the investments which have been published in, in the World Economic Forum uh, paper and how we really attract the trillions needed to, to move to a full circle economy. Thank you so much, Rogula. So I think I have one uh, final question on the uh, plastic uh, treatment for both um, Hejun and, and Rogula. But after that, I want to 
I turn to the to the room. So first of all, Hey June um, Wuri Financial Group is a member of the Finance Leadership Group on uh, Plastics, which supports the development process of the future plastics uh, agreement. So I want to ask you both: What are the needs and expectations for the future agreement on plastic as an internationally legally binding instrument to help the finance sector to fully play its role? and to support finance or redirecting of finance flows towards a circular economy uh, for plastics. And I also want to ask you, what are the possible long and short term consequences of the future agreement for the financial sector? So I don't know which of you, you wants to start. Um, hey, June. Thank you. The <laughs> Plastic Community Leadership Group에 대한 뭐 요구 사항과 그리고 기대는 아마 유넵 FI가 더잘 아시고 더 <웃음> 말씀을 더잘 해주실 것 같지만 제가 얘기를 조금 드리면 어 먼저 국제 협약에 대한 저희 발행과 기대에 대해서 먼저 말씀드리겠습니다. 어 현재 유넵 FI 플라스틱 금융 리더십 그룹에 참여하여 금융 부분에 대한 국제 법적 구속력 있는 국제 협약 제정을 지원하고 있습니다. 어 저는 정책, 기술, 금융, 지식 연구 이네 가지가 균형 있게 조화되어야 한다고 생각합니다. 어 하지만 금융을 보면 플라스틱 오염의 부정적인 영향에 대해 모두 공감을 하고 있지만 실제 해결을 위해 구체적이고 적극적인 조치가 기후, 생물 다양성 아젠다에 비해 많이 부족합니다. 왜 그럴까요? 어, 우선 각 기반의 재무 역량도를 측정할 수 있는 툴과 데이터가 부족합니다. 아직까지는. 어, 해양으로 유입되는 미세 플라스틱을 포함한 플라스틱 전주기에 대한 순환 경제로의 금융 흐름을 전환하기 위해서는 기후 리스크에 대한 스트레스 테스트처럼 어, 재무 영향도 분석과 같은 이제 플라스틱 리스크에 대한 스트레스 테스트가 필요하다고 생각합니다. 그리고 TCFD, TNFD처럼 그 결과를 공개할 체계적이고 투명한 글로벌 공시 프레임워크 역시 필요합니다. 또한 모든 이 모든 활동에는 과학적인 근거가 뒷받침되어야 하는데 IPCC, IPBES와 같이 순환 경제 분야에서도 국제 연구 기관에 대한 적극적인 좀 지원이 필요합니다. 그리고 여러분들도 잘 아시다시피 기후, 생물 다양성, 순환 경제 또 해양 이슈는 모두 연계되어 있습니다. 장기적인 관점에서 주요 이슈에 대한 각 시나리오를 또는 각 분석을 통합해야 된다고 생각합니다. 어, 한편 그리고 아직 플라스틱 이슈는 규제 논리로 대부분 접근하고 있습니다. 시작 즉 시장 마켓 관점으로 접근을 하여 어, 예를 들어서 탄소 배출권 시장 같은 플라스틱 크레딧 거래 시장을 설계 개발해서 관련 산, 산업과 기술이 촉진될 수 있도록 해야 합니다. 어, 단 전제 조건은 모두가 신뢰할 수 있는 공신력 있는 아까 말씀드린 에발비 체계가 뒷받침되어야 하는데 뭐 앨런 맥 아더 파운데이션처럼 어, 모, 모니터링 시스템 같은 모델도 우리가 참조할 수 있을 것 같습니다. 그리고 더 중요한 것은 금융기관이 고객 참여를 통해 비순환 경제 활동에서 순환 경제 활동으로 즉 비순환 경제 활동에서 해소하고 철수하는 것이 아니라 순환 경제 활동으로 전환해야 하는데 어, 예를 들어서 부정적으로 스크리닝된 고객들이 그들의 밸류 체인에서 기회를 식별하고 그리고 구체화할 수 있도록 지원을 해야 되, 됩니다. 네. 그리고 고객 관여도 확대를 위해서 단순한 순환 경제 데이터 수집에서 순환 경제가 기후, 생물 다양성, 폐기물 해양에 미치는 긍정적인 영향에 대해서 고객의 이해를 좀 지원해야 합니다. 따라서 고객의 인식 제곱 및그 지식 공유 그리고 실질적으로 기여가 큰 활동들에 대해 자금 조달뿐만 아니라 맞춤형 금융 상품 그리고 서비스를 설계하고 제공할 수 있도록 기술 지원이나 컨설팅 지원까지 이어져야 하겠습니다. 뭐 방금 말씀드렸던 내용은 제가 참여하고 있는 그 금융 리, 플라스틱 금융 리더십 그룹에서 국제 협약 제정에 대한 금융 부분을 지원하기 위해서 최근에 발표한 메시지입니다. 
한국에서도 본 활동에 대해서 상당히 기대가 많습니다. 최근 합의된 생물 다양성 GBF에 이어 어, 의미 있는 결과가 좀 만들어지길 기대하고 있습니다. 그리고 두 번째로 질문 주셨던 그 쇼텀과 롱텀에 대한 결과를 좀 생각해 보겠습니다. 단기적으로 어, 법적 구성력 있는 협약과 그에 따른 각국의 정책 지침으로 바탕으로 어, 규제가 생겨서 플라스틱 오염에 대한 부정적인 영향이 단기적으로 줄어들겠죠. 뭐 비유를 하자면 플라스틱 넷째로 상태가 되겠죠. 하지만 온실가스 완화 경로처럼 부정적 영향을 급격히 줄이는 과정에서 신기술 개발 그리고 산업구조 전환 등 막대한 비용이 발생할 수 있습니다. 하지만 장기적으로 볼때 투자 촉진을 통한 관련 산업의 성장, 기술 발달 등그 긍정적인 역량을 증가시켜서 해양을 포함한 자연 회복뿐만 아니라 사회와 인간의 건강 회복에도 영향을 미칠 것이라고 생각합니다. 또한 규제 기반이 아닌 투명성을 확보한 시장 중심의 경제 체제로 전환이 되어야 하겠죠. 또 기후 생물 다양성 해양과 연계해서 목표를 설정하고 다중 효과가 나타날 수 있는 조치 또는 기술을 개발하여 어, 향후에 그 시너지 역량이 중요한 결과로 나타날 가능성도 충분히 있겠습니다. 어, 저는 개인적으로 끝으로 궁금합니다. 현재 PRB, PSI 서명 기간의 리포트에 플라스틱 오염 해결을 기후변화 대응과 같이 어, 영양 분석의 최우선 아젠다로 공개한 기업이 과연 얼마나 될지 좀 궁금하고요. 어, 환경의 모든 영역이 서로 연계되어 있어서 어느 것도 중요하지 않은 것이 없습니다. 균형 있는 시각으로 협약과 정책을 수립해야 됩니다. 궁극적으로는 파편적으로 좀 대응하고 있는 탄소 국경 조정세, 생물 다양성, 순환 경제와 같은 중요한 아젠다를 연계시켜서 종합적인 대책을 좀 마련해야 합니다. 그러기 위해서는 여기 모여 계시는 아시아 금융 기관들이 모두 협력해야 하겠죠. really The treaty must be have clear goals and targets and obligations. It needs to be a partnership amongst the, the governments, the businesses and the civil society. Um, the businesses play a key role also because they are the ones who on one end produce the plastics but also are the ones who recycle it then and bring it back into their packaging. But they're also the ones who do innovation around how to replace packaging. Um, we really support, we need support on innovative upstream and downstream solutions. The investments I mentioned before are mainly focusing on downstream uh, plastic recovery and recycling. But upstream, when we talk about innovation, um, i i we also need support on that. Um, I think we need attention to exactly financing, and that's why we're here for, that we attract more funding mechanisms, blended finance mechanisms, philanthropic capital, but also market-driven capital into the industry. Um, and something we have not really touched upon here is that we need the provision to include and protect all workers throughout the entire plastic recycling value chain. 60% of plastic globally recycled is collected by the informal sector. It's a human issue. It is, has an impact on health, we heard before, but it also creates jobs and opportunities. And we need to make sure that we talk here responsible sourcing and, and, and real Uh, inclusive and protective worker conditions. Um, in the short term, I think, while the treaty is negotiated, um, I would say policies, com governments can continue to implement policies which enable plastic recycling to happen, particularly when we talk about food grade application. A bottle goes back into a bottle, so it's really the full circular solution. Um, extended producer responsibility schemes help to attract more capital because that helps and stabilizes the market, that draws the need. Um, 
we talked about new financial instruments, whether these are um, instruments for small and mid-sized enterprises or blue bonds or green bonds. And then I think something which is also key, we need to start developing local markets, uh, domestic capital markets, which help um, funding these investment opportunities. Thank you so much, uh, Regula, for that last uh, contribution.